السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم سبحان الله نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستنصره ونستجيره فإنه حقا من هذا الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين 
اللهم إنا ندعوك ونتوسل إليك أن تصلح لنا ديننا أن تصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأن تصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأن تجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير وأن تجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت إن شاء الله Today I want to reflect upon the calculus of immoral decision. The calculus of immoral decision. SubhanAllah, part of that calculus is some basic existential questions that a reflective human being, the human being who is even reasonably, moderately reflective, would ponder. Consciousness itself the consciousness that you and I are gifted with for the time period that are, we are gifted with, gifted or that we are entrusted with, that consciousness that starts at one point and ends at one point in this world is placed within a time span A time span that I submit to you is fundamentally incomprehensible to us. The very fact of where our consciousness comes from and where our consciousness ultimately goes, the very fact that there was timeless time before our consciousness. And the very fact that there is timeless time after our consciousness presents us with the reality that there are things in our existence that are simply beyond the realm of our comprehension. Even if you are gifted with this consciousness and you take God out of the equation completely, you are still confronted with the endlessly puzzling, ultimately incomprehensible reality of time before time. All the events that ultimately led to the existence of your consciousness, the billions upon billions upon billions of years that culminated in you obtaining consciousness, you know that logically there were generations of human beings before you that enjoyed consciousness. And you know that logically before the generations of human beings that enjoyed consciousness, there were generations of other things that enjoyed consciousness, like animals, like dinosaurs. 
And before these beings, there is a flow of time and the existence of material and the birth and death of planets and stars and galaxies. Realms of reality that are timeless, that are beyond time that came before you and the same that comes after you. You see, this is the challenge for everyone that wants to deny God. If you claim that this universe has no owner and no organizer and no shepherd, then make sense of the concept of eternity, which is fundamentally inaccessible to human comprehension. If time exists in perpetuity, in eternity, simply continuously going on and on, the universe beyond your consciousness, after your consciousness, where does it go? Is there an end to this universe? And even if you comprehend an end, what is after the end? What are the parameters of the space in which we exist? Is it comprehensible to you that space can exist endlessly? That you can keep traveling in the universe, never reaching an end? And if you come to terms with the reality that within human consciousness, you, we are not equipped to understand space without end. And we are not equipped to understand time without end. If existence itself confronts us with that that is imponderable, that cannot be pondered and cannot be made sense of, then why is it such a stretch to believe in a master of a universe that owns this reality but is beyond this reality? Our intuitive sense tells us that things just don't materialize without a first cause, without there being an originating point. But the reality in which we are born tells us that we cannot comprehend what is before time and we cannot comprehend what is after time in the same way that we cannot grasp a universe that goes on forever, a universe that has no limits. So why is it such a stretch to believe in a God, in a higher power, in a higher intelligence that owns this universe. If there is a higher power, 
to our existence, then either this higher power gifts us with the gift of consciousness and is aloof and disinterested, or this higher power gives us the gift of consciousness as in indeed fully vested in what it creates. This is a fundamental question in morality. If you take God out of the equation and you ask yourself a basic philosophical question, if there is no God, or if there is a God and this God is not interested in what we, having been gifted with consciousness, decide to do or not to do, if it's a God who's aloof, basically doesn't care. The calculus of a moral decision becomes very difficult. Ponder, for example, in the past few days, a simple incident halfway around the world. A professor of Islamic studies at Azhar University his name is Sheikh Mahmoud Shaban. That professor in 2014 appeared on a television program and in that interview he made the moral decision to criticize the dictator of Egypt and to say that this dictator is committing injustice and that the massacre of innocent people in his country is unjust. From 2014 to 2021, this sheikh, for making that moral decision to speak out against a dictator in a television program from 2014 to our very day has been in and out of prison, mostly in prison. A few days ago, after being detained pre-trial with numerous charges being leveled against the sheikh and then dropped and the new charges being filed. Finally, the sheikh was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. No credit is given for the time he's already spent in prison. And his health condition is abysmal. And it looks like he is on his deathbed. I wouldn't be surprised if any time in the near future we hear that he died, he's dead. Sheikh Mahmoud Shaban, halfway around the world, takes a moral decision to speak against the dictator and as a result, from 2014 till today, he's mostly in prison and he's finally sentenced to 15 years in prison, hard labor, he suffers a stroke and his health 
crumbled to the point that he joins the ranks of so many others, people that we've talked about, like Hassan Farhan al Malki or Sheikh Abdullah al Oda, or the scholar Ahmad Sabir, who's still in prison. If there is no God, the calculus of a moral decision would necessarily have to be processed through the singular perspective of self-interest. If there is no God, then what is rational and what is logical is I would take an incident like that and I would think about it and whether I decide to take a position to speak about it or not speak about it is a mere matter of preference. If for some reason it elevates or enriches or otherwise stimulates my consciousness to speak about an injustice half, a, half a, a, a way or half around the world to speak about an injustice, then I exercise that preference. But if I don't exercise that preference, If I decide that this injustice is irrelevant to me, then I defy you to present a philosophically coherent argument as to why it should be relevant to me. Without Allah, without God, the calculus of moral decisions becomes processed through the prism of the singular ego. The very idea that I should care becomes itself as much of a puzzle as eternity and as endless space and as time before time. If you introduce God in the equation, then the calculus is very different. Because here, the very consciousness that I have is a trust. And the way I exercise that consciousness is a fiduciary duty owed to the giver of that consciousness. And so it becomes not just logical, but imperative that I care about what another human being has decided vis-a-vis -vis their moral stance and what they suffered as a consequence. Now imagine, if you will, those who claim that they believe in God, but they fundamentally turn this God into an amoral being. They fundamentally turn this God into a God 
of egoism. A God who cares about their divine ego, whether it is stroked through acts of technical obedience or defied through acts of technical disobedience, but otherwise that God has no cause, has no purpose, has no moral trajectory. Approach it from a different perspective. If there is no God, the fact that someone half away, half around the world, away, half around the world, decides to take a moral stance and suffer a grave injustice as a result is hardly of interest to you. Or put differently, one would be very hard pressed to make an argument as why it should make a difference to you. What does one appeal to? Whatever the argument, one is appearing simply to personal life choices and preferences that border on preferences in the realm of aesthetics. Do you prefer a life where you stand for justice or do you prefer a life where you don't stand for anything? There is no further judge. There is no ultimate authority. There is nothing beyond that we can appeal to. But if there is a God, and this God is a moral God, then as human beings, we are then tied together through the tapestry of morality. Then why do I care about morality that does not directly impact upon me and my life choices and my lifestyle? It is because this God desires it to be so. And I am a trustee of that God. And I owe fiduciary duties towards that, what that God entrusted me with. The real calamity, the real calamity is when you have people who claim they believe, who say they follow God, who say they are believers, but the way they imagine and construct that God makes this God as if non-existent. In other words, when all is said and done, it becomes the God of secular logic, a God who's not vested in right or wrong, not vested in principles, not vested in moral calculus, a God who simply says, I created you so that you can stroke my ego. And of course, it is no wonder that that type of religion, that that type of God fails to impress fails to impress so many people who escape a secular logic of no God to a secular logic with a God who is thoroughly secularized. 
the escape from nothing to nothing. And that's precisely the crisis in modern religion. That's precisely the crisis in modern religiosity. With God, the calculus of moral decisions becomes a very serious matter. If a man halfway around the world stands up and speaks against injustice, and from 2014 till today, he's in prison, and then he's sentenced to 15 years of hard labor, a professor of Islamic studies at Azhar University, And if, as it looks, that this man will lose his life, he won't even emerge after, uh, uh, beyond the 15 years. As we said, if you have a moral God, which I believe that the God of Islam is a moral God, then we human beings are all connected to one another through the tapestry of morality. So the plight of a man like that, what type of moral obligation does it create upon you? If you are a believing Muslim, as we said, if you're not a believing Muslim, you can just ignore it and say it doesn't affect me. And as I said, we will find it very difficult to create a moral argument as to why it should be of concern to you. But if you are a believing Muslim, if this is the level of sacrifice, imagine this man in the hereafter and imagine you. This man comes before God and says, God, you told me to speak up against injustice. This is what you told me in the Quran. And this is what your prophet taught me. And I did. And because I did, I didn't get to enjoy a career as a professor at Azhar University. I was fired from Azhar University. And because I did, I didn't get to watch my children grow up. I didn't get to take care of my children and to raise them. I didn't get to buy the latest model in car fashion. I didn't get to buy fashion and furniture and whatever human beings enjoy. I didn't even get to see my children grow up. I didn't get to spend warm nights with my wife. I didn't get to do any of that. I largely spent my life in prison. And ultimately, before age 50, I suffered a stroke and then died. All because I believed that you, God, demanded that I speak up against injustice, and I did, and there are the consequences. And then you come along, and there is this model of Sheikh Mahmoud Shaban, and then there is your model. And you come before Allah. And Allah says, okay, let's see now your sacrifices. Uh, I skipped out on chatting with my friends to do prayer, maybe. 
uh, I gave up going out to dinner. I gave up a few vacations. But the calculus of a moral decision. Because you see, you don't get to that type of moral predicament unless there is a God. And unless this God is there to carry out justice. If you are fine with a world in the likes of Mahmoud Shaban and their sacrifices or on an equal moral plane with me myself who has sacrificed nothing and never stood for anything and never been anything for anything. If you're fine with that, then don't believe in God. Because if you believe in God, then you also believe in the moral calculus of moral inequality between the person who sacrifices and the person who doesn't sacrifice. And if you are the person who doesn't sacrifice, then my friends, you're in trouble. You see, it's like going to school in a class where everyone at the end is haphazardly appointed a grade. It doesn't matter what their effort is. There is no curve. There is no comparison of performance according to one student. You don't compare one student to another. You simply, at the end, give some people A's, some people B's, some people C's, some people F's. And because that's the system, it's a haphazard system, things are pointless. You can't say, well, why did I get this grade and this person get this grade? That's the system. As opposed to a system in which your grade depends on the performance of your classmates. If I get an A, it means that compared to my classmates, I excelled. If I get an F, it means compared to my classmates, I am far substandard. The calculus of a moral decision is on that curve. Because that's the God of justice. Ponder this life and ponder where you stand on that curve. In light of the fact that there are people who are tortured, people that are oppressed people that suffer, people that lose their lives because they testify for God. Where are you on that curve? Are you an A? Are you a B? Are you a C? Are you a D? Are you an F? If you have half a brain, half a brain, you don't wait to work it out after you're dead. 
Don't kid yourself. The incomprehensible is a part of our living reality. Where did things come from? What does eternity mean? What does space mean? Is there an end to the expansion of the universe? Does the universe just keep expanding endlessly? Is there a point? Is the universe after this universe, beyond this universe? If you can't answer any of these questions, then don't be so shocked that you are asked to believe in a God where there are also incomprehensibles. Like where did God from, come from? The incomprehensible is an embedded, coded part of your life already. It is only egoism and arrogance that makes you think that if the incomprehensible occurs, relates to God, then it's disqualifying. And you pretend as if, other than God, everything else is comprehensible. That's the assumption of an idiot. The assumption of an idiot. Don't be one. أقول قول هذا واستغفر لي ولا الله لي ولكم اسأل الله يستجب لكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه رب العالمين The calculus of a moral decision is so critical because all indicators are that this is where we rise or fall as human beings and as Muslims. Consider how many failed moral decisions were they before the Earth, planet Earth, got in the shape it is in currently. Consider how many failures in moral decisions were there before the inequity in wealth that exists in the world today is the way it is. Consider how many failures in moral decisions were there when the number of refugees in the world is at unprecedented levels. And the numbers of displaced human beings and the number of human beings who confront the threat of starvation and dying of thirst is at unprecedented levels. And you tell me whether our moral calculus has been adequate whether this secular age where we have either evicted God out of our lives or secularized God so that God is not intrusive and God is not demanding, whether it has worked out for us, whether the results are good results, But you see, my first responsibility before humanity are Muslims. And let's talk a little bit about the calculus of moral decisions among Muslims. Recently, 
I'm going to share with you a news item. Recently, Saudi Arabia announced that for now years, the Saudi government has been commercializing Mecca and Medina, turning Mecca and Medina into a form of capital venture investment. So much so that the water of Zemzem is now bottled and sold in the market. And of course, in an authoritarian state like Saudi Arabia, the scholars, the same scholars who speak endlessly about whether women can be in the same space as men in the masjid, didn't dare say a peep about the bottling and selling and distributing of Zamzam water as if it's a commercial ver venture. But recently, Saudi Arabia announced that for all Muslims in the West who wish to go to Hajj, they have to process their applications and go through a lottery system through a company that is owned by the Saudi government. So all your data, all your information will go to this company that is owned by a Saudi government. Now, it turns out that this company, one of the main owners of this company is a fellow, and I have a whole bunch of articles about this here, is a fellow who is very prominent in supporting the Hindu Nationalist Party of Modi. Let this sink in. So the rapidly Islamophobic party, ruling party of India, is closely associated with a person, that person is a member of the rapidly Islamophobic party. And that person is a belonger, is, is an investor, a major investor in a company, Aqil. So Aqil, which is going to process all Hajj applications from the West, more than 50% is owned by an Islamophobic Hindu nationalist. Now, it is not just that, but the same company, Aqil, that's going to be processing applications for Hajj by Muslims in the West, is a long-time investor in Israeli startups. From 2002 to 2016, this company invested $350 million in Israel. Now, at the same time, this consortium of pro-Israeli consortium of investors who invest money in Israel and who are very pro-Islamophobic Hindu nationalists, supporters of the Hindu nationalist government in India, 
that is staunchly and openly Islamophobic, that recently has banned Hajj, has banned the Adhan, and recently has declared plans to tear down over a thousand mosques, that has incited numerous genocidal attacks against Muslims. Yes, it's that company that invests in Israel and that same company that's going to be processing Hajj applications. But of course, the triangle is not complete without the United Arab Emirates. Because a major investor in this company and a major investor with the Hindu nationalist investors is the Emirati government that has invested millions of dollars in these companies who have in and millions of dollars in Israel. Now, at the same time that millions of dollars are being showered upon the Islamophobic, Islam-hating Indian people or people in high power in the Hindu Nationalist Party of India, at the same time that millions of dollars are being poured to them, and at the same time that millions of dollars are being poured into Israel. The UN, now the oldest refugee population in the world are Palestinians. There are about six million refugee Palestinians, stateless Palestinians in the world. Palestinians who were born in refugee camps, grew up in refugee camps, and will die in refugee camps. And the UN, in the meanwhile, issues a cry for help, saying that we have a hundred million dollars funding deficit. If you don't help us out, the Palestinians living in refugee camps are going to starve to death. So imagine this picture. All your information, if you apply for Hajj, is not just going to be with the Saudi government, it is also going to be with the Islamophobic Hindu nationalistic government of India. That, that same company has very close and numerous ties with Israel. So your information will also be with Israel. The Emiratis are major investors in Israel and in the Hindu nationalist government. And now the Saudis, through the Emiratis, are becoming major investors in the same way that they were major supporters of Trump the Islamophobic, rabidly Islamophobic president, they are now major supporters of the rabidly Islamophobic government in India. Meanwhile, Palestinians in refugee camps desperately, urgently need $100 million just to survive. Meanwhile, a report comes out about Gaza that the blockade of Gaza is so horrendous, so evil, that 50% of Gazan youth contemplate suicide before the age 18. Now, the calculus of a moral decision What is astounding, the same Muslims, the same Muslims 
and I'm sure there are plenty of Egyptians who can read about a sheikh called Mahmoud Shaban, a professor at Azhar University, being thrown in prison from 2014, finally being sentenced to 15 years with hard labor, and even read about his death eventually, and it wouldn't bother them one iota. They would still go to the masjid, they would still have an epileptic fit about whether women are praying in the proper place in the masjid. They, they would still talk ad nauseum about the hijab. They would still talk about ad nauseum about the most petty and meaningless things. Implying that God is equally petty and equally meaningless. They would feel no compulsion. Their moral calculus is nearly identical to the atheist. Why is it my problem? But that same individual is what got us to the point where Mecca and Medina, the gatekeepers to Mecca and Medina, becomes an Islamophobic, Hindu nationalistic investor. The keys are turned over to this investor. We can let the Palestinians starve and we can invest in Israel. And yet, and yet, there are religious leaders in the West, like Mufti Mink, like Hamza Yusuf, that have no problem having intimate, close relations with the Emirati government and the Saudi government, and their conscience is not at all troubled. And the error is in your moral calculus. Don't kid yourself. Where are you on the curve? An A, a B, a C, a D, an F? When Allah says, you knew that Hamza Yusuf is the darling of the Emirat, and yet your Islam was not at all troubled by what happened to Mecca and Medina, to what happened to the Palestinians, to what happened to Al-Quds, and not at all troubled by the plight of Kashmiris who live in huge concentration camps like the Palestinians in Gaza. Your moral calculus was focused on the hijab, your moral calculus was focused on nail polish. You made me into a petty god, into an immoral god. And now you want to say you scored well on the curve? There are people like Mahmoud Shaban who sacrifice their entire lives, and you. Your problem is you sacrifice the vacation, you sacrifice the meal, you sacrifice the career. That's your problem. The moral calculus. Let me close with this. I was struck. Biden plans to visit Saudi Arabia. In an interview, Biden is asked, is this trip to Saudi Arabia where you are going to basically say to the Saudis, we're not worried about Khashoggi, we are fine with the authoritarianism of MBS, we're not worried about the human rights record in Saudi Arabia and all the executions. Let's not forget, it wasn't too long before Saudi Arabia just executed over 60 people and one just one swoop, including children. 
We are going to tell Saudis, as long as you're killing Muslims and oppressing Muslims, we have no problem with you. We have no problem with you committing the genocide in Yemen. So Biden is asked, so is this trip because of oil? Because you're going to go grovel to the Saudis because we need oil? And Biden's response was most intriguing. Biden said, no, it is only in part about oil, but it is about something much bigger than oil. It is about Israeli security. The only thing on the table that involves Israeli security is that Egypt gave two islands, Tehran and Sanafir, to Saudi Arabia, which Saudi Arabia in turn is handing over to Israel. So that Israel can have unfettered access to the Red Sea. In any other country in the world, this would be treason. The president of Egypt would be convicted of having committed high treason by giving up the territory of his country. And it would be high treason for the king of Saudi Arabia or the prince of Saudi Arabia to hand over territory to the Israelis. But the big boss, Uncle Sam, that's what Uncle Sam wants. And the trip is not just about oil, it's about Israeli security. And what is about Israeli security? Oh yes. Let's invest more, more millions of dollars in Israel so that Israel can more effectively suffocate and snuff out six million Palestinian refugees, millions of Palestinians in Gaza, millions of Palestinians in the West Bank, leave alone Jerusalem. In light of all these betrayals, in light of these fatal failures in moral decision making, the shiuch that could be like Mahmoud Shaban could speak out, but unlike Mahmoud Shaban, they're not going to go to prison for 15 years. All that's going to happen if they speak out is that they might lose their fancy home, maybe. Or they might have to downgrade. Not live. They might have to downgrade in terms of how fancy their car is. They might have to downgrade in terms of how fancy their home is. They might have to downgrade in terms of how fancy their prestige is. But these are the sheikhs that you elevated. These are the sheikhs that you celebrate. These are the sheikhs that you made sheikhs. The likes of Mufti Mink and Hamza Yusuf. So figure it out. The calculus of a moral decision. Where are you on the curve? when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the time will come for me, for you, and for them. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم أسأل الله يستجب لكم إني داع فأمن اللهم اغفر لنا اللهم ارحمنا اللهم تب علينا اللهم اهدنا لأقرب من هذا رشدا يا علي عظيم يا رب العالمين Allah forgive our sins guide us to the straight path Help us to be better Muslims, to make the right moral decisions, to be ethical human beings, 
الاثقو مسلمز يا علي يا عظيم يا رب العالمين واقم الصلاه